first lecture was mostly on the numerical strategies and what may or may not happen. But given that has been achieved or you have something in hand that solves the Navier-Stokes equation in you know, whatever form and with whatever scheme, then the question is how do you do LES? And, then, and that's what I want to talk about now. I'm going to talk about a little bit of turbulent closures. I'll talk a little bit about two-phase flows, but I'll get back to some of these in more details tomorrow too. And uh, I will not, I'm just repeating this again to point out that uh, we are interested in closing turbulence first. So forget about combustion. If you're doing LES of combustion, do to turbulence first. Prove to, prove to yourself that you can do turbulence first as, as a turbulent LES first and then think about combustion. Uh, and if you have a combustion code, it does a laminar code that does combustion, it does not mean that you can do turbulence. I mean, they, they have two different elements, so you have to be careful. And, and a turbulence code may not do combustion. You know? So you have to think ahead about the limitations. For example, what we are interested in is trying to simulate this green line and whatever that is, even though we don't know what the black line looks like. We have no idea what the black line is. It's some, so we are, this is what I call an unsteady signal. On an average, the line might be red or wherever the average is, uh, but there is fluctuations and the fluctuations are, has structure in it. That's the main point, that LES solution is not like a random fluctuation. There is structure in it. It has got low, high frequencies and low frequencies, a bunch of scales, but it doesn't have the highest frequency or the smallest scales. The question is how far do you go to do the smaller scale? So a lot of it is in books. I'm not uh, going to repeat all of them. Uh, typically what you do is just like in RANS, you do time, in RANS you do time averaging. You take the solution, uh, you assume it, only the mean is available and all time dependent terms are tossed out. In LES we are doing a filtering. Basically what you're saying is that the small signal that I just showed earlier is filtered, maybe an averaging. The simplest is an average. You just take two solutions and average. But remember the DNS solution doesn't exist. You're assuming something existed finer than the grid that you're running in LES and you're filtering it using some filter function that has to be defined uh, such that an a, a instantaneous signal might be broken up into some some solution bar quantity which is actually unsteady and also space dependent. So unlike RANS filtering where there's no time, it's only space dependent, this is both unsteady and space. Even though notationally it looks the same, it is not, the meanings are different. For example, rho prime bar is not zero as, it, as you may know. The other big point here is that typically it is done all the time in papers, nobody talks about it. Uh, but if you do a filtering of a gradient, and this is a spatial gradient, it is not equal to the gradient of the filtered quantity. This is only valid on a uniform grid. You can prove in a top hat filter, and like top hat is just a volume filter, uh, it's only valid in that region. Anytime you have a stretch grid, body conforming grid, or any other type of filter, this is invalid. That means your LES equations that I'm going to show you are wrong to begin with, okay? You can never get that, those kind of equations, even though we use it, because there's inbuilt error. The question is how bad that error is, we have to worry about. So typically, this averaging, as everybody knows, is what we call Reynolds averaging, or it's averaging low Mach number codes will do this kind of filtering, that they still have this problem. In density, compressible codes, uh, low Mach number code, actually I take that back, um, incompressible co low e codes do this kind of filtering. Uh, compressible codes and low Mach number combustion codes typically use Fabry filtering, where the density filter is, is typically like a, it's like the Fabry filter in RANS, but the implications are different. So for example, there are many filters you can come up with. Typically the box filter is, they just average over the box. It's a, typically used in finite volume schemes. And sometimes what we call LES is a, what we call implicitly filtered LES, which basically means that you don't do anything, you draw a line and you say it's filtered. You know, you're not actively, not explicitly filtering. Now if I were to take the finite volume code and said that I want to do a Gaussian filter, uh, 
you will have to physically operate every every time step you'll have to do this filtering operation that means you put this the g g is actually f i mean if i just uh, made them just you know typically everybody uses g uh, so it is a transfer function that is short cut off if you look at it in physical space it is a short cut off it looks like that like a delta you know, but it is continuous in spectral space in other words if you take a short cut off filter and go to spectral space it is a wavelet type filter it means it shows some feedback from higher wavelength gaussian filters are continuous in physical and spectral space um, which is like a gaussian function uh, you can also use spectral cutoff. Most spectral codes, when they do LES, they are using spectral cutoff. So what, what sometimes we say the spectral cutoff is a, like a top hat in spectral space. So top hat in spe physical space and spectral cutoff in spectral codes are very similar. So when you transfer it, it's sharp in spectral but continuous in physical. The point is that this operation is actually never performed. We implicitly assume if you are doing finite volume, we just use that, but we don't usually use that. But there are implications later on. I'll show you. So here's signal. The top hat means you just average the signal. That means this is a signal, and the lines is your grid. So the signal is maybe maybe much finer than that. So maybe there is a grid finer grid. You don't have that grid, so you just say that I'm whatever below that. I'm wiping it out. I'm averaging it. Well, Gaussian, you can see, is a little bit better in approximation than that, but then the Gaussian filter in a physical space code will have to be explicitly performed, so it's very expensive, so people usually don't do that. So what are the implications? So here's a signal, some signal we just cooked up, uh, and we said we want to have a cutoff frequency, this is a signal in time, and we said oh, we want to have a cutoff frequency of 40 hertz, so that means the dotted line is where we want to chop off. That means the LES is going to only see these guys, is going to lose these guys. You know, so the question is, if, you were, this is a, if this was a DNS signal, that means a true signal, and you filtered that explicitly, take that grid point and average it using the box filter equation, and you look at the solution, you'll see this, 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 and that. You see that you get the frequencies, the amplitude of this guy is lost a little bit, and these guys are still showing up, but it is still present, very small. If you do a Gaussian filter, uh, it looks almost the same. It actually loses out the, uh, the higher frequency. The point is that we don't really care about those high frequencies. That's supposed to be modeled. We, what we are interested in is in these things. But what I'm pointing out is that just taking a very signal and make, make an arbitrary cutoff means that you, you are going to lose something. On the other hand, this is a signal that you are planning to capture. That's all you're interested in. And this, you can see they both look qualitatively similar. Uh, so both filtering are valid approaches. Typically in finite volume scheme or even finite difference schemes, uh, uh, box filter are done. Actually, it's not even done. Like I said, it is implicitly assumed. Uh, uh, and spectral filters are cut off or done in spectral schemes. So Gaussian filters are not used that much. Right. And uh, so the spectrum is still plotting. Is it because you have not plotted the negative part that we don't see them, or uh, is the signal specific? And I think this is specific to the signal. This was just run to that. But like I was saying, uh, the, the, uh, there will be, you mean the complex conjugates you're talking about? Is there? I mean, there may uh, so a box switcher in Fourier space has a negative. Right, right. Yeah. You're only showing the one side, yeah. Yeah, negative components. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but that, this is just to show it because we are only doing this problem. We are not actually filtering. I just wanted to show the effect of filtering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It it, it uh, This is just a, just a schematic, just to show what the Gaussian. This is like I said. This signal doesn't even exist. I mean, this is a ramped up signal, right? I mean, this is this this is a this this is an actual use of the Gaussian filter on a signal. This was just a cartoon. I'm just saying that Gaussian means that they, 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 if the signal was going like that, the mean would be not just lined up like that. Even that is not approximate. You know, you, I would say this is more 
an right example of what it is. That was just a cartoon, you know. It's just that Gaussian gives you the, the tails a little bit more than, uh, uh, but the tails have some effect if you go to a different grids, you know. So this one was a simple one example I'm giving, you know. So I mean, the point is that Gaussian is never used, you know. So, but it is a valid approach and there is a book by Sago that goes into details on a lot of these approaches. It's very worthwhile going through that. Uh, the point with problem with Gaussian filter is that even if it is good, uh, every time step you allow to apply it, you know, and that's very expensive, you know. So nobody does it. here. The box filter also we are not applying it. We just saying we just assuming it is box filtered. So we are looking at the solution. So here, just to give you another example of what happens, if we take the isotropic turbulence in a box, it's again a cartoon experiment. It's not. Uh, this is actual simulation of a DNS of a isotropic turbulence in a cubic and 128 cube. And we used a filter size of some grid size and we doubled the filter size. And uh, basically they're showing that, um, you know, they both have similar sim similarities at this state. In this scenario, it doesn't show much. The cost might be more for a Gaussian than box, but uh, but there can be differences in higher order statistics. I'm just pointing out that it is it is it is possible to implement it. Uh, it can have some differences, uh, but as a practical purpose, we don't use it. You know, you know. So, it, it, but we will talk a little bit about uh, test filtering a little bit later. Another aspect, again, this is a cartoon. This is maybe you want to think about that is a turbulent isotropic spectrum. So you have an inertial range. K5 third, some large scale spikes, and the dissipation spectrum is peaking near Kolmogorov scale. And um, I'm just telling you what are the possible scenarios. If you are in DNS, you're getting the whole spectrum because your cutoff might be here. Now, if your cutoff is here, that means you are that means you have to model the effect of turbulence uh, in that scales on the resolved part. So basically, like LES in physical space, this is in wave number space. Uh, but let's say your cutoff is uh, in the middle, uh, K, KE. Uh, that means all the stuff under this curve he has to be modeled. But this is energy is inertial range and it is the dissipation is peaking. So typically we use AD viscosity type models, uh, subgrid models. And the spectrum might show pictures like that. Like in other words, depending on the cutoff, the spectrum might actually die. Just like the top hat filter I showed you. The, frequencies near the cutoff will actually get weaker. It actually might even occur slightly before it, you know. But ideally what you want is that you want to capture all of this perfectly and then disappear. That never happens, by the way, because of aliasing type effects. Uh, um, but but you will, what you might get is that you'll come like this and it'll tail off here, you know. That would be more practical. But if you start tailing off right here, that's wrong. That means your numerical scheme, energy is decaying too rapidly way before cutoff. That means your physics, the, so the conclusion here would be that if you saw that, you would say, oh, your scheme is horrible. That's what I would say. That means that this LES is not going to do anything because LES is only modeling these, so it might affect the wave numbers around here due to non-local effects. But uh, uh, if it is starting to decay from here, something else, the grid is too coarse or something is not, the scheme is too dissipative. You know? On the other hand, if the scheme is perfect, that it's got no dissipation, and uh, and it starts to uh, pile up, uh, that means like you you uh, why would it pile up? One way it will pile up is that your Reynolds number is too high, and your grid is too coarse. You know, so you're basically trying to push towards this cutoff, uh, closer and closer to this direction. So that means that the dissipation in the scheme and the subgrid dissipation, the sum total of it, is not sufficient to keep the scheme dis uh, stable. So your energy will pile up at the cutoff because there's no way to, for the energy to go out. You want the energy to go into the dis dissipate, uh, but you don't want the energy to go feedback. But if it starts piling up, you'll have a crash. Code will crash. So typically, that's that's like so. One way to test this problem is how. You basically take a coarse grid problem. You take the high Reynolds number turbulence that you could do with DNS. Let's say you're doing DNS at 128 cube. 
then you run DNS at 32 Q for the same Reynolds number. Turn off the subgrid model. So you run the scheme, same solver with the same scheme at a much coarser grid. So by that, de by that definition, what you're saying is that, well, I don't have any dissipation, uh, but everything in that is in the turbulence is going to has to dissipate. But there's no subgrid model. So there is no way the scheme should dissipate it. So the energy should pile up and the wave number around there and, and actually cause the code to crash. So one of the challenges for LES of turbulent combustion is that for turbulence, you have to first do an LE, DNS of an LES grid, in the LES grid, and actually show that you are not getting the same answer. In other words, if you get the same DNS result, that means the scheme's numerical dissipation is taking over, which is typically what happens in a lot of commercial codes, that uh, the numerical dissipation of the scheme is driving the system a lot more than you realize that the subgrid model is not doing anything. So if you're doing an LES and say, I'm doing LES, I'll say, well, turn off the model, and do a DNS of the same problem. And if you get very similar answers, then I'll say, well, what, what is the point? You know, you're basically not doing any, the LES is not doing anything. So that's a typical test for a, an LES code, not an LES code, an LES grid, because you're basically running no subgrid model, you're running a DNS calculation with a, LES, uh, uh, the core script. Um, so showing that a code can do DNS is important. A code, a, to show that a code cannot do DNS on a core grid is also important, you know, you know, so, and without any model. And then when the model is put in, you want to show that the dissipation occurs only near there, not way up there, because you, then that will mess up the large scales which you are trying to capture. So this is basically I've already repeat, repeated it, but uh, you can read it. There are some issues about even this filtering techniques. Everything I said assumes uniform filter. If you have a variable grid, what is that filter? The grid is changing from grid to space. So you say it is a local filter. Well, the local filter will have different effects, feedback effects. So ideally, if you want to do a perfect uh, top hat filter on a stretch grid, you pick your filter size. And the filter size should be independent of the grid. So when we say the filter is the grid size, that is the cheap, cheap way to get out of the picture. You're not really doing anything because you don't want to do anything. But if you really want to do a filtering, then you should choose the filter size. Uh, so that's why we call it an implicit filter. That means that we're not doing it. We're saying it's, it's filtered. But if you really want to do it right, in, on a even for finite volume, grids with stretch grids, a top hat filter, you will have to choose the filter width to be independent of the grid. So if the grid is stretching, your filter width is this, you might have three grid points here, two grid points there, whatever, but that means what? You'll have to do the filtering every time step. You're back to square one. So that's why, again, explicit filtering is very little, is do not done, you know, I mean, you know, because it's expensive, you know. But that is the only, you know, people talk about this a lot. Uh, you know, how do you get grid independence in LES? Can you get grid independence in LES? The answer is no, not necessarily, because the, in the filter is a grid. Change the grid, the filter changes, so turbulence will change, so there will be some effect. But if the filter width is independent of the grid, then you will get grid independence. And it has been proven in some simple test problems, but practically it is impossible. So well, well, when RANS people say, oh, I'm getting grid independence, well, they can't really get grid independence either. That's what I was saying about refining the grid. Eventually, you will re reach a point where numerics will start being affected by their resolution. But they can at least claim that they are doing grid independence because they are refining the grid. With LES, with a ex implicit filtering, it's not possible unless you do explicit filtering. You know? So that's an important point. But uh, again, we don't do it because it's not feasible. So here's an example of a paper code that we did. This was a low Mach number code. Uh, it published a long time ago. Uh, uh, this is an experiment, Comte Bellon Corrigine's experiments in 1960s, classical isotropic turbulence decay. So it's with the turbulence is decaying behind a grid, typical turbulence, uh, turbulent decay problem in books, uh, Tenekis and Lumley. Um, so here are, 
we are simulating the LDS code without the model. That means we are doing a very coarse grid DNS. So you look at this and you say, well, uh, GT means uh, uh, Gottlieb Turkel is a, is a predictor. This is a, a new scheme that we were looking at. Uh, these are these are uh, predictor character central schemes, and this is an awesome fourth or awesome five, what they were called. Uh, and if you look at this, you say, hey, awesome five is good. It is matching the experiment. But actually, awesome five is wrong. It should not match the experiment because it is showing that it has too much dissipation by itself. The scheme has dissipation. So it's dissipating the turbulence. It looks like it's dissipating, and you think it might be good. Actually, the perfect answer should be the code should go like that, should blow up. You know, if a code was very nice, a very higher order, it would not even decay. These codes are also dissipating, but it's dissipating way less than the real physics because there is some inbuilt dissipation. This was a finite fourth order scheme, I think. Uh, yeah, second order in time and fourth order in space. So this, what this tells you is that this scheme is actually too dissipative. So if you put a subgrid model into it, it is going to make it even worse. This one may be okay, but uh, but it is still not as good as what you would like. But at least you know, you know. So this is like a test of a LES code without the subgrid model uh, to do the modeling. Uh, uh, what happened here? Okay, I may have to. Well, I guess we might as well show that. So this is the whole ball of wax type of equation. This is the equations that do two phase. This is the equation for the Eulerian and gas phase. I might as well show some equations. This is the, you know, you see the typical things. This is the volume fraction of the gas, uh, the fluid, fluid volume fraction. These are the phase change source terms appearing from the liquid phase. Uh, all the subgrid terms are, are the explicitly subgrid terms that show up, but all these terms notice that the filtering is inside the derivative. So it, all the equations are fundamentally wrong. That commutation of grid versus and the filter is implicit in this. So there's an error in all of this, except that nobody deals with that. So again, but you shouldn't remember that there is an error. Uh, the last equation is perhaps new. This is mass fraction, total energy, momentum density. This is a equation that we use for the subgrid kinetic energy, and I'll show that a little bit later, which solves for the energy inside that spectrum cutoff, what is behind the spectrum. And it contains even the, a term that concludes the correlation between the two phase, you know, com contributions from two phase, which I'll get to it. The equations are given a long time ago someplace. Uh, um, by the way, a lot of these papers and citations are available on my website. I'll give that to you later on. So all the subgrid terms, by definition, are there are a bunch of these terms. The first three are, are, are what we call the fluid mechanic terms. Although combustion with combustion, they are also, also affected. But they will exist even in non-reacting flows, not, not even without species, because these are the Reynolds stresses, the enthalpy fluxes, the viscous work term. These are terms that explicitly appear only when there are species. Even mixture fraction, you might get some terms, but these are written for generalized multi-diffusion species, so it is more generalized. Uh, the other point, another point is that the equation of state also has some additional terms because of the filtering of the, uh, of the, uh, of the correlation between scalars and temperatures. So as a challenge then, that means that if you're not, if you're, if you're not doing reacting flows, you have to close these. If you have to do a reacting flows, you have to close these, and you have to close these. And most of the time, we neglect most of them. You know, so that's the best solution, you know, because we don't know anything about them. But if you if you were to close them, and you you think that turbulence is in the small scales are dissipating, Kolmogorov said that that you know, small scales are dissipating. All the dissipation dominates in the small scales. So what we need is a dis dissipation model. So we say that maybe we can use an isotropic eddy viscosity, similar as RANS, except that the scales are now based on the missing scales, the small scales. So now the eddy viscosity has a length scale and a velocity scale to close that. And there are two classical models. One is this Magronsky's model everybody knows. It's an algebraic model. 
and the one equation model that is actually everybody cites Yoshizawa, but actually it was done by Schumann back much earlier, uh, um, uh, which is based on the subgrid kinetic energy. So for purposes that uh, might be clear later on for combustion applications, the subgrid, we personally believe in using the subgrid kinetic energy model. Uh, I will mention some of this, but I, this is, may not be again clear unless you read the books, but I already mentioned about the commutation errors, that that's an important issue. Uh, Galilean invariance, I guess you may have heard about that the Navier-Stokes equation is a Galilean invariant, right? It's the rotation translation should remain, the equations should remain the same. Once you put a models into the code, the LES equation should also be Galilean invariant. The, the, the equation that I showed you right now without doing anything are Galilean invariant because you haven't done anything. Once you put the subgrid models, which I'm going to be explaining, it will have to be Galilean invariant too. And a lot of models do not allow Galilean invariant. In other words, the LES equations with subgrid models are no longer whatever equation, some equation. They don't even satisfy Galilean properties. So that has a problem. Then another problem that is not again obvious that you, you create a model for subgrid eddy viscosity and eddy viscosity turns out to be negative. You know, how can a viscosity dissipation be negative? You know, the whole, it fails, you know, like it's mathematically inconsistent. Or what happens if the, 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 the trace is supposed to be kinetic energy and the kinetic energy turns out to be negative? You know, things like that. So it's called realizability of the model stresses. So it is implicit that the model, model quantities, that means the models that you stick into these, must be physical and you know it has been talked about many years ago you know a long time ago nowadays people don't talk about this and a lot of models that people cook up nobody even talks about it but if you don't if you if you don't test the models in the real problems and actually look for it see what it is doing you might not know whether it is reliable or not so these in these impose constraints locally and in time during the simulation so what it means is that during the simulations, you actually have to look at the modeled predictions of these quantities and compare it to the realizability requirements. Are the stresses positive? You know, are the stresses uh, eddy viscosity positive? You know, how many grid points is it predicting it is negative? You know, if it is one percent, two percent, who cares? If it's twenty percent, something is not right. You know, your, your code is messed up. You know, so. So these are testing that you have to do, and obviously truncation round off that I won't worry about. So anyway, I, I will, most of the results I'm showing is based on our code. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's grown from a long time. I wrote it, I started writing it in '86, but uh, now it's a massive structure, massive code. It's got it's a modular Fortran 90, 90, 2003 um, uh, using Python, CMake. HDF5, XML, Fortran. So if anybody wants to come for graduate work, you better know all of that, you know, because you're supposed to work with real codes, you know. Uh, it's maybe 10 million lines of codes, you know. But there are modular structures. It allowed many schemes. So if somebody wants to write a new scheme, if you follow the rules, you plug it into the code and you can test all the tests that I've done. We have a computer that is set aside that runs test cases every night. It runs about 700 test cases. It pulls the code from the library. If one student messes up the code, we immediately know who did it and why, and we blame, and then he's, he's in real trouble. You know, if, he, if he doesn't fix it, he's in trouble. If he can't fix it, his, his code is erased. He has to start all over again, or, or he has to leave the lab, you know, one of those two, you know. So, so each, many people have played a part in it. Many people have graduated, and some of them are working. Uh, uh, we even have fluid structure problems. We can solve solid, solid phase, liquid phase. Uh, it's a three-phase solvers, and it, it can do rocket fuel stuff. And you know, anyway, it's got many models and many models. The model that I will be talking a lot more will be what I call the subgrid linear eddy model, the LIE in that code, because it has some unique features. Uh, and I'll spend a little bit of time today also on this data analysis, because this is not observed. People don't think about this, and actually, this is the the stopping point. You'll find that life will not go forward, even with this code, because you can't figure out what you got. You know, so it doesn't matter how long it runs. 
if you can't pull things out of it, you're in trouble, you know, and we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, you know. Which one? Yeah, Jameson is actually that is the central, the there's a central scheme sitting in there. It's hidden in there, and that is where it requires, but it requires an artificial dissipation, so it's sitting in there. Yeah, I mean, there, there is actually a discontinuous Galarkin option in there too, but it, nobody knows how to write, work with it because after the student graduated, he didn't write documentation, so so nobody wants to touch the code, so it's disappeared. You know, so that happens. You know, there's a lot of features in the code that are not here because nobody knows where it, what it is. You know. And but the person who did it graduated and got his PhD, so you don't want to look at it and say he made a big boo-boo, you know, so. <laughs> this is the new stuff that we are working on. Uh, this hopefully will, will graduate one student if he, if he gets the work done. So I should have put it in green, red, because it's not completed yet. This preconditioning to do uh, a lot, take larger time steps, which might be useful for some problems. So, so you can see that, uh, if we have complex transport properties, uh, variable, you know, we use Chemkin or Cantera, you know, we can do multi-species, we can do real gas, JW, uh, solid phase, uh, uh, Migrinison type models. So uh, these are all, the design of this code is modular in the sense that if you write something, you can plug it in and you can take advantage of all, the, not all the features. Uh, the bad thing is that the documentation is designed such a way that if you don't know what you're doing, you'll never do anything. You know, and very soon, that that's why you have to learn the physics and the math, not the physics and the science behind it, in order to use the code. Uh, so just to come up with some modeling approaches for momentum, typically everybody uses Smagronsky's model in in literature. Uh, we've been using dynamic models. Some people are starting to use in Europe, and there are variations of it. Similarity mix. I'm not going to go through a lot of them or any of them that matter, but I will just point out some unique features and why certain things work and not work. So this is a typical lady viscosity closure. Everybody has seen that. This looks like a RANS closure, but this is for LES, the sternal stress. If you're using Smagronsky, you say that the lady viscosity in this is modeled by using the resolved strain tensor and the grid size. By definition, this grid implies uniform grid. Obviously, we, we won't We'll ignore that for a minute, but let's say we have some filter, explicit filter, implicit filter, but it is, it is algebraic and is based on this resolved strain. The one equation models essentially say that, uh, so this means that uh, if you think about it from a length and velocity scale, the AD viscosity for Smagronsky has a length scale, which is the grid size, and a velocity scale that is related to strain rate and grid size. That's, that's what it is, basically. You know, it's just velocity times length, and then some, some coefficient, you know, which we know, which is called the Smagronsky's coefficient. Now, if you use the same concept, the main relaxation for the one equation model is that you say the length scale remains the grid scale, but the velocity scale is now based on the subgrid kinetic energy, which is the, the energy in that spectrum beyond the cutoff, and since we don't know what it is, you solve for it. And if you if you've done turbulent courses already, you will know that in the limit of e equilibrium turbulence, this one equation reduces to that because production becomes equal to dissipation. That's the classical, you know. I mean, you, you recover the algebraic model from so the algebraic model is in here, but it allows for non-equilibrium between production and dissipation. And the main advantage of that is that you can actually run coarser grids, and that's what uh, because this. Equilibrium only occurs at the dissipation scales. So if you really want to use algebraic models, you have to have very fine grids, which is obviously not a good thing for LES. If you, so our argument has been that we need to do coarse grids, in which case we need smarter subgrid models. Obviously, the next main thing that has happened is the Germano's method, which basically says that if this is resolved and that's the subgrid, and then you do an explicit test filtering, Basically, you dig on a grid of twice the grid, and you get the the difference between that of the result is some quantity which they call like the filtered subgrid quantity, and you, you use that. I mean, if you're familiar with the details, you know you can actually use this to close the find the coefficient. 
But there is lots of problems with it if you are familiar with LES. To get the coefficient, you assume that the filtering operation on the closure, when they tell IGS, you basically are filtering this. That means you're filtering this entire quantity. That means you're filtering this quantity. But in order to get the coefficient from this model, the coefficient has to come out of the filter. Now, this coefficient is a spatially varying term. That means the filter and the spatial filtering are not are supposed to commute, which they don't commute because the coefficient is varying. So that's a major major assumption in this Germano's method. But assuming it could be done, you can get the coefficient by taking the least square, like in classical books. It looks like that. But it has another big problem. If you look at the denominator, and if you look at the denominator, it has a term like A, some big term, minus another big term that looks exactly like that term except with the double filter. The, pro the problem with this one is that in most flows, in fact, there are you know, even isotropic turbulence, the, the filtering, filter term and the actual term are not that much different. This term is very small or could be almost exactly the same. In other words, Mij could go to zero. So this dynamic evaluation has a lot of ill conditioning. Everybody, there's a lot of papers on it, this sort of description. So there's lots of fixes, Lagrangian fixing. But to compute it locally in a complex flow, it never is done. So when people write, say, oh, I'm using Germano's dynamic evaluation in complex combustors, they'll never say what they're doing. But in one sentence, they will say average or something, or they use time average value, or they do a lot of things that don't tell you. But the main point is that the coefficient can vary very rapidly from grid to grid because this term can go to zero. That is to be very careful if you're using it in complex flows. So we were, since we were interested in ramjets and combustors, uh, we were looking at that earlier back in the 90s. And, and uh, uh, we looked at the experiments of this, this stress quantities, and we found that the stress, uh, the the sub the subgrid stress, um, and the from and if you look at the test filtered uh, uh, Leonard stress, what they call Leonard stress, they were highly correlated. So uh, back many years ago, somebody said, "Hey, let's just model that as a coefficient times Lij, because Lij is very well known. It, it's a test filtered quantity; you can compute it." But it was not, it, it would have been a good filter model by itself if it, it worked, but it never worked because this, this has too much noise and it has, it's not dissipative enough. It's like, so it, it didn't work. So what we suggested was that instead of doing that, we'll take that model to work at the test filter level. So instead of saying this works at the grid level, so what this model is saying is you take a coarse grid, you filter the solution, and say you can use it in the fine grid, and the grid scale filter. What we said was that, uh, well, we'll take the filter solution and we'll apply it at that scale itself and in the same model, and we'll assume, we'll just compute the coefficient at that scale. So the Germano's method uses the difference between the two filtered values, while we use the solution at the test filter value only you know, to compute the coefficient. So what the advantage of that is that the coefficient looks almost the same, but the denominator is a non-zero quantity because this is well defined. The kinetic energy is resolved because you're you're on a coarser grid. So the denominator really never goes to zero. It is always non-zero except near wall at, at the wall. But that but we don't do dynamic near the wall. Uh, so it turned out turned out that this approach has been very stable and robust for a lot of applications. It's actually influent also on one of my students, Graham Golden, put it in, but i never seen it work properly in there. And um, that may be for other reasons. But, uh, um, but, uh, but the idea behind this was that the, co that the dynamic evaluation is local. So when we do dynamic, we don't do, have to do anything in complex flows because this model stays as long as case subject kinetic, kinetic energy exists. And we are solving for that. And that's the advantage of this approach that you are running LES with a relatively coarse grid, so that there has to be subgrid turbulence. No, in other words, if you're not, if you do a very fine grid, there is not going to be enough to any turbulence to go with. You know, but if you're doing a coarse grid, there has to be turbulence, so subgrid kinetic energy has to be non-zero. So that means that the kinetic energy at the twice the grid has to be non-zero. So that allows us to be self-consistent in this approach. 
No, we, we are using this, we are using the dynamic approach, but, but we are not using, dynamic Smagrinsky's model is only based on this, this separation. That is the dynamic, the dynamic filtering is just, uh, the, you know, th this is the dynamic ap approach where you take the test filtered stress, subtract from the Lano stress and so, and take the difference. So what we are doing is that we are computing everything only at the test filter. We are not taking the difference. So we are not using the Germano's approach because this, this, how to compute the coefficient is just least square. You know. Are you using one equation model or one, one equation model? We are using one equation model with this, this, this evaluation of the coefficient. You know. um, which, so that means we are not using the dynamic. That's why we are saying the test filter is just that while in Dynamics, Magronsky, you have to take the difference. And that's where the problem comes. So, so we are using the one equation. So all the results I'm showing is basically, at least my, my work, I'm showing some other people's work later on, is one equation with dynamic approach using this approach uh, where it stays stable. And it actually turns out to work pretty good. So this is a, old, uh, this is a very old paper, but this is the same ex calculation I showed you, the isotropic turbulence problem. Uh, and this DSM is dynamic Smagrinsky's model and it is volume average because the isotropic box, this, this was not even done by us, this was done by Moines group in Stanford. Uh, they couldn't go below 48 cube for this case because the flow solution became unstable. And this is the LDKM, the localized dynamic kinetic energy model that we are using that, that picks up the model. Now this was the same case that I showed you earlier where if you turn off the model, the, mo the prediction goes like that, you know. So the model is picking up the decay quite accurately. It also picks up the effect of rotation, which is an important point, because when you rotate isotropic turbulence, the energy cascade to the small scale is reduced because there is a Coriolis force term that is pushing the energy back. So the slope has to change with rotation. Now, if the dissipation was controlling independent of the physics, it won't care. The, so, but the model actually says, yeah, there is subject kinetic, the energy that is going into the small scales has decreased because of rotation. So it picks up the effect of rotation. This is published a long time ago, but uh, which is an important test also. Just take turbulence models and rotate it to see whether the turbulence works. More recently, we said, well, the problem with this model is that we still have a length scale sitting here and we just say it's implicit the, it's a length scale. We don't know what it is. It's the grid size. The grid is variable, but we don't care. You know, we just assume the local cell size. But it is a variable. It is an unknown quantity. Theoretically, you need the length scale. So we started looking at options to actually find the length scale itself. We said, why not look for the length scale also? So this is a cheating of the explicit filtering. Remember I said you can actually explicitly filter, in which case there won't be a length scale. If you did an explicit filtering, that will be your length scale. You know, but but I don't want to do that. It's too expensive. So rather than do that, I said let's let's try to look for a length scale. And one way to do that is to compute k times l as a subgrid model. Now, if you've read uh, fluid mechanics, uh, turbulence uh, kinetic energy is uh, u squared. So from a statistical point, it is a single point, single time autocorrelation, right? It's U, U, the autocorrelation. So if you take the correlation and move it to a distance, it is a two-point correlation, you know? So, and, that, and, and the two-point correlation is based on the length scale. So KL is actually an auto two-point correlation uh, at a two distance. Actually, in reality, L would be a vector because, or, or a tensor because the correlation could be three by three. But basically the idea here was that, okay, well, let's not worry about many length scales. Let's just solve for one other length scale, which is an autocorrelation, a two-point correlation, and then it can be represented as KL. So we, we, we did that many years ago. We, we haven't really applied it for combustion yet, but we are starting to look into it again. But the advantage of this is that there's some advantages. Anyway, this is a, some coefficient. We have dynamic versions of it. Um, the advantage of, there are two types of advantages. Because length scale is now independent of grid, maybe it'll become grid independent. I don't know, but that is possible. But actually what is the more interesting is that it allows you to bridge the, the LES from VLES to DNS. 
because you want to be able to take a LES code and refine the grid forever, keep the model turned on, and if the model is correct and the code is good, you should become DNS automatically with the model working. In other words, the model should go to zero, should keep producing zeros. You know, that's the right way to do it. You know, you don't turn the model off. You let the model on and run DNS. And if you go to very coarse grids, it should start becoming like a VLES because the model should start recovering more and more. Right now, mo most codes don't do that. And so, but the K is an advantage because when it becomes LES, it is close to the grid and uh, it actually reaches DNS as grid becomes smaller because the length scales become smaller and smaller eventually in KSTS and kinetic energy also goes down and approaches DNS. But when, when it becomes larger, it starts approaching more the VLES limit, closer to the integral length scale. So it has to have, you know, I was mentioning the realizability here, are some of the, this is, these are the realizability constraints that you have to have these um, in order to make sure the code works. So we impose this, so that means we use these constraints to, there's a couple of papers where we showed that using the constraints, you have to impose a restriction on what this KES model predicts. In other words, if it say subject kinetic energy is this much, you need to compare it to the realizability value, and if it exceeds that, it's a violation. You know, so you have to check that. And so, anyway, the point is that there is this approach has some some requirements which makes it not that general. And the other important point, which is obvious, is that uh, if you want to get length scale, you have to do the take scale divide. Oh, I forgot to mention now. Eddy viscosity is done like that, so both terms are computed. Uh, but if you wanted to get the length scale, you have to take KL divided by K, right? So that can have trouble too because at some locations, K can go to zero because there is no turbulence. So there is a, uh, uh, you have to be careful how you use it, but you know, so there are some restrictions on how the length scales can vary. It's not controlled just by the KL over K. Uh, but we applied it, I just want to show this quickly because I don't really, not focusing on these. We were applying this for uh, pitching wings and aerodynamic applications. And uh, there's an angle of attack 16 degrees and what we are showing here is the ratio of the length scale to the grid. It ranges from one to 10. So that means when it is one, it is acting like LES. When it is very large values, it is starting to act like something. You don't know what it is, but it's not LES, you know. And, and you can see from there that it is picking up all this shedding structures. Uh, uh, it was reasonably re reliable in the sense that uh, we looked at the spectrums and we can see that the separation point was captured, the, the vortex roll up. So anyway, there is some discussion of this. We even looked at oscillating problems. Uh, and, you know, it's not, I wouldn't call it perfect, but it, uh, it's a pitching wing. Uh, this is a low oscillating problem uh, of an aerofoil, which means the flow remains attached. When you go to a dynamic stall, it still picks it up, but there is still a lot more, lot more work to be done. We are still working on this KES method. It is not an operational methodology that we are using uh, at this point. What we are using, however, is the compressible form. The first method, I, everything I showed you was basically, uh, I would call it, Compressible flows, but no shocks. Nothing to do with real compressibility. When I say compressible, I'm basically talking about shocks. And so there's a variation of that. It was published a while ago, where uh, we take the same model, but we add additional terms, uh, and we explain why it accounts for the acoustic fluctuation. So if you have an unsteady shock, like the jet in cross flow I showed you, and the shock is oscillating, it'll generate turbulence. And so the, and the, the acoustic fluctuations that will generate turbulence that com comes in a term like pressure velocity correlation. And then because the uh, production and dissipation is non-equilibrium there, you start getting a dilatation effect, which is actually very low because it is proportional to the turbulent Mach number squared. So you have to be really turbulent and compressible <coughs> in order to get that term. But with this, you can take the same model and go from subsonic flows to supersonic flows and high, high combustion problems. So, this, actually, this is what I, I just repeated it, but this one is actually uh, 
using that compressible LES model, which is why we got it. We actually showed that if we didn't put those terms in, uh, in a one, one, not this, I don't forget which paper, you don't get that uh, effect properly. So, okay, so uh, that was just the turbulence aspect. There's, I mean, turbulence can be spent a long time on it. I'm not uh, uh, going to go further. Uh, Uh, so what I want to talk about now is combustion. So again, we already repeated these things. And there are many models out there, and I want to talk about question is, is there a single formulation that can do all flows and all combustion systems? Because as I mentioned, what's the difference? I mean, what's the difference between a gas turbine or a rocket? Theoretically, the same fuel, the same burning the same things. Why are them? Why should the models be any different? And but, you know, obviously there are different models, and I'll talk about some of them today. Uh, the other point is the reaction rates. You know, finite rate chemistry becomes a very critical aspect for a lot of applications. So when you're talking about LES filtering, how do you filter a very nonlinear term? I mean, we don't, as it is, we are making approximations for other terms. This, this becomes a very tough, tricky point, as you may know. Uh, uh, sometimes you avoid it by using flamelet type approaches, but uh, the main point is here is that there are large scale convection of scalars by large scale structures. You, you convect it, rotate, wrinkle it, stretch it, and but none of those effects molecularly mix anything. You know, so combustion is unique in that sense that the flame is affected by turbulence at all scales, does all kinds of things to the flame, but to have the flame to actually exist, the species have to mix at the molecular mixing. So turbulence can mix the thing, but molecular diffusion still has to occur at some level in order to have combustion. In the, in the premix system, you don't have that problem. You only have wrinkling because you already premixed. For non premix you have to have that. And molecular mixing, even if it is fast, which is what most models assume, may not be the same. If you have hydrogen and methane, you have differential diffusion. The molecular diffusion is orders of magnitude different. So you can actually have diffusional effects that may not be captured. You know. So you have large scale effects and small scale effects. In the small scales, you have mixing by small eddies because LES means you have taken away a lot of scales, and but those scales have to play a role. You, those small scales must, turbulence still has to play a role in the subgrid. So here is the first statement where we contradict turbulence modeling that I just mentioned. Because our approach for fluid mechanics is, Kolmogorov says all turbulence it does is dissipation. So just put an eddy viscosity model, we are done. Uh, LES says, in combustion says, well, if you don't resolve it, the flames are always going to be smaller than the grid, thinner than the grid. Combustion is occurring at the small scale. So the small turbulent scales that you are ignoring must have some effect, must do some turbulent mixing even for premix, let alone for non premix Then on top of that, you have to have molecular diff diffusion, which is again a small scale effect. Then you have to have finite rate chemistry and then heat release. The heat release is what the energy feeds back because it's volumetric expansion. You have heat release that comes back from small scales to large scale. That's how the, then it affects the pressure, the fluid mechanics. So there is coupling between small and large, large wrinkles the scales, in small scales wrinkle it further, you have diffusion reactions, and then heat release that feeds back. You know, so the question then becomes is that uh, how do models handle these things? And that's the typical uh, aspects to cover. But before I go there, because some people asked for it, and I'll, uh, since I had these, it's very important you're doing unsteady three dimensions. That's four, four dimensional problem. It's an expensive calculation. If any of you have done that already, you know that. You know. Parallel computing is pretty much the only game in town. You know, maybe there are other ways, but the old vector scaling is not possible anymore. So what we need is something called strong scaling. Now, strong scaling means you have a problem. Let's say 10 million grid points. You run on 1,000 processors. It takes you 1,000 days, you know, or let's say one, 10 days. You, know, you go to 5,000 processors, it should take you one, no, 10,000 processes should take you one day. That means that the same problem will complete faster uh, so that you can actually do some work. 
you know, that means that's what we call strong scaling in the sense that your load is fixed, but the, so the load per processor decreases, but the turnaround becomes faster. So most practical applications, you want strong scaling. If you don't get strong scaling, you can do practical problems. Weak scaling is the opposite. That is typically used by the DNS guys who want to run billion grid points on billion processors or whatever, you know, it's big jobs, you know. They want to, it still take them billion hours, but they will still, they want to run, so they, their job size is fixed, but they want to run on more and more processors. Uh, in, these people theoretically are very few people in the world because they are only ones who have access to thousands and thousands of processors. So if you are, if you only have 500 processors and you suddenly get 1,000, if you ran 1,000, you better speed up the code response 50 per, 100%, otherwise you're not scaling. So a lot of times scale, scaling, strong scaling studies are done at two processors to four processors to eight processors, everything looks perfect. You go start going from eight to 800, everything goes downhill, you know. So, and, you, and it turns out that everything you spend all your life coding has turned out to be junk and you'll have to start all over again, you know. So sometimes it's worthwhile thinking the big problem, strong scaling problem and going from there. And okay, obviously fluid mechanics, it's just fluid mechanics, it's domain decomposing, you chop it up and send it out. Particles, you have bigger problems. There are spray sitting here, the domain is this much. You have one processor dealing with spray and a thousand particle uh, grid points, while this one is doing thousand grid points with no particles. This guy is now way slower. The slowest, the weakest link controls everything. So you have to do dynamic balancing. Turn on chemistry, stiffness, that guess brings in other issues. And so it's lots of headaches and you have to do all kinds of things. We have a, we combine all kinds of things. We are now starting to look at GPUs and Intel fees, but right now we're using typical codes, which are typical MPI codes. Uh, we're just showing the performance of the code. Uh, this was many years ago testing. Uh, these are different types of quad cores. These are very old machines. This is an IBM BGP where we went up to 4,000 processors. Uh, and we get, you know, then the idea is to get keep getting linear scaling. Uh, we have linear scaling up to 16,000 processors. For some cases, we got near linear scaling up to 60,000 processors, but we don't have 60,000 processors. So I'm happy with 4,000 because that's typically what we use. Maximum we have access to, you know. Uh, particles also has to be very careful. So for example, here we did this scaling for particles and trying to track how many particles we can get this, you know, so we, we were showing that this was, uh, you know, we only ran up to a thousand processors, but, uh, uh, but the advantage of this code was that we could run up to four, 240 million particles on 512 processors on a, on a grid, on an actual grid. And it turned out that based on the coding, we can have a half a million particles per processor of this machine, which has one, one or two gigabytes of memory. So, you can run a lot of particles if you want to, but you don't want to, you know, so. Um, the other problem, which I was mentioning a little, is that if you start running these problems, you get a lot of data. You know, I have 300 terabytes, or no, I got two petabytes of backup storage and 300 terabytes of online storage in my lab. And half the time, we don't know what's in there because nobody's looked at it. You have simulated it, some of these big runs produce 100 terabytes, of, you know, 100 gigabytes of data, maybe 100 megabytes per snapshot, you know, and, and you store a lot in time. So at the point you have to do realize is that when you start running these problems, you are starting to run. What happens if you start running on 100,000 cores? How do you write a restart file? What if after you run for three months, the code crashes and you don't have any restart file? You're done, you know. Uh, and uh, what happens if you have to get line, somebody says, what is the time temperature profile over this outflow, but that outflow is over 100,000 processors. How are you gonna, gonna get that one line out of it? It's not trivial, it's, it's, an, it's an unsolved problem, and nobody knows how to do these things. And how do you post-process anything? Like all those pictures that I showed you, it is not, those were all run on 1,000, 2,000 processors. You have to bring all the data over multiple time, collect them, post-process them, and, and, you know, where do you store these things, you know? And a lot of times I have a, what I call a automatic scrubber. Every month I just delete files. And students, if they haven't touched it, it gets erased. 
So they said, well, I wanted that file. I said, you haven't touched it. So what are you doing with it? You know? So because you don't have storage, you know, you can't back, and there's no backups. That's the interesting thing. When you run this big type of problems, there's no backups. You know, you, code is backed up, but your output is not backed up. So you better get it right the first time or better process on the fly. So that's what we are doing right now. So what I think in the future will be that the computers will be big enough and fast enough that we will not store anything. And, you, and that means if you don't post process on the fly, and let's say today you want to look at temperature and methane mass fraction, and somebody said, that looks strange. What is OX there? He said, oh, I, haven't, I didn't store that. You know? And how long did you run? Well, for three months. So what do you do? You go back and run for three months. You know? And so your degree takes longer and longer and longer. You know? And let's say machine crash in between, which happens a lot, you might be spending time. So you have to think before you run these big jobs. And, and if somebody says, oh, I don't care. I'm going to store everything. You know? And then you say, well, I, well get, show me OH. Oh, it'll take me three months to figure out how to get all the data back because it's sitting on 500 different machines. You know? so, so it is not an easy. So data, data, data IO is a big data problem. I mean, combustion, turbulent combustion is a big data problem. If you look at the DNS people and ask them for anything, they said, we have three snapshots. You know? I can give you one snapshot, you know, but it'll take me one week to get it in our archive. You know, and, you know, but that's all they have. And many of those people, they don't have any restart. They just run, hopefully it doesn't crash. And if it crashes, good luck to them. You know, or sometimes they use store some things, depending on how you do it. So we were doing some things like uh, we are working with this group so here is a case where we are running on 60,000 processors, uh, 64,000 processors, uh, 577 cube grid. And the code without anything scales very well. But we wanted to extract something from it while the code was being on. Nothing. We were just extracting, I forget what it was, maybe vorticity or velocity. You know. and, and we were looking at different software that can do it on the fly. That means the code is. You are, you are extracting information while the code is running with another software. And notice how the performance fails immediately. The code was running what, nice, but once you start running it, even at, six, uh, I don't know, this is around 64,000 processors, we wanted to hit 100,000, but we never made it that far because the machine wasn't available. But so, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the clock cost also goes up. So running the problem is not trivial. and. It, it's, it's a good point to think about these before saying that I can do something. Because all times, what do you build? In the end, you'll have to rebuild again. And I've done that many times. So, but those days was not nice. Now we cannot afford to do that. If we have to rebuild, I'm not going to be, going, we're not going to do it. Our code has to keep working on these kind of problems. So we are, we are telling people who work with the hardware, software people, I say, you go figure it out. I'm not going to do anything. So, but you know, that's still an unsolved problem. So given that, I'll just go back to combustion now. Uh, so uh, you know, subgrid modeling, again, is written in a vector form. Uh, again, I wanted to show in the, uh, different applications. So let me, what happened here? So it, we start with something like a premix flame. And typically, you have a flame wrinkling. Uh, how you resolve it, notice that the flame is thinner than the grid. So obviously, you can never get a flame like that. You will have to capture the grid over a certain points. So uh, typically, those who don't want to resolve the flame assume a, a flame is absolutely thin, has nothing going on in there, and you, you use um, what we call a flamelet model, which basically uses a mixture fraction approach. And there are you can use a generalized form where you use a mixture fraction and a progress variable, and which has a source term. Um, and the source term typically you try to build a model for flame surface density. And I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I'm just trying to highlight some key features uh, about what, what it is. But uh, these models are what most of the flamelet people are worried about. They're trying to model these kind of problems where there is no chemistry in the problem. It's all built into a library. We assume that the chemistry, what you're simulating with a mixture fraction, a progress variable, which has no diffusion, and it has equal diffusivity, there's no molecular diffusion some, you know, because these are defined quantities, is Lewis number one type behavior. Uh, 
but all the physics is held hidden inside this closure for the reaction rate, uh, which in, in turn is depending on the closure for flame wrinkling structure, you know, which has to exist. Uh, by this definition, you can see a lot of it depends on the fact that it's a premix type problem. There are variations of this for non premix, but uh, um, but that's typically how it goes. The alternate is people who do say, well, we don't want to resolve it, we want to capture the flame, which means that we now have to capture a flame that is thicker than the grid because we need at least a few grid points to capture a flame structure. But then we have to model the filtered reaction rate. And that becomes a problem. And then there are various variations of that. And uh, so some of them, typical ones are well known, but there are other ones too. Uh, uh, I guess uh, this, uh, so there are many ways of, so reaction chemistry models, uh, I'll just skip through these because these are just to summarize if you want to read it. Uh, there are what I, what we, what I would call geometry models where they don't care about the structure of the flame, it's all geometry. So we track a thin front uh, and there are advantages of that, uh, 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 but there is no rate parameters, it has problems with uh, chemistry. There are some then you, you use, uh, and the chemistry itself, oh, I forgot to mention this one. The flamelet libraries have to, you have to assume that the flamelet library holds for the problem in question, but once you make that assumption, the problem is always a flamelet. So you cannot go away from the flamelet. Uh, in the finite rate models, uh, you can assume, you don't have to assume there's a flamelet, but the problem then is the res resolution of the flame. You have to capture the flame. So the flame is very thin, you get into computational issues. The flame is, has a, can be resolved, then you don't have a problem. When you look at chemistry, you have to do a lot of other things about how to close it. And these are words that are available. I, I just given you analysis. These this are techniques that people have come up with to reduce the cost of chemistry calculations. Sometimes you ignore it, like in mixture fraction. Sometimes you do one-step chemistry, which obviously has limitations. And sometimes you do multi-step reduced chemistries, or in I, ILDM, where you carry two or three dimensional equations. Uh, um, and typically laminar flamelet people as claim that they have the full chemistry, but that's in a library which is all parameterized to the mixture fraction. So the question remains is that is the mixture fraction appro approximation valid? And, in, and it also assumes that there is no differential diffusion explicitly occurred. And then you can see in, in some complaint mentioned here that it has difficulties dealing with partial premixing, lacks reaction diffusion coupling, and sometimes it is not an important issue, you know, but you have to be careful where, what approximation you use. The other point is that if you use, uh, compare the chemistry, how small a chemistry, you know. This is, and for Professor Williams was here and he must have talked about those. Uh, if you just look at the adiabatic flame temperature or laminar flame speed, uh, you can see here that, uh, I forget what is what now. Uh, uh, this is all propane air mechanisms uh, starting with one step to four step to seven step to 15 step to detailed chemistry. Uh, I don't want to go into these numbers here because they're not very clear either, but uh, you can see that uh, you really have to get to a bigger mechanism in order to get the right flame speed and the adiabatic temperature. One step is crazy. I mean, one step might be tuned okay here. So if you're running equivalence ratio one, it might be okay, like, like Westbrook and Dreyer. Uh, but if you go away from it, it is gone. So if you're running one step for 0.8 and 0.9 and one, the chemistry will have to be changed for every case. If you use the same chemistry, you'll get different answers. And if you, uh, um, so if, and when you're looking at all this partially premixed problems where equivalence ratio is varying and the chemistry is over a whole range of uh, mixtures, you are in trouble already because the chemistry one step or two step will have trouble. You know. So chemistry, once you go to finite rate, the, the, the chemistry has to be looked at much more carefully before you go forward. You know. um, yeah, this is just to explain that the scales of structures, you know, it may look like thin, but sometimes it is not actually thin. Uh, um, these are, uh, another point is that I want to, reason, the, I just want to point out if you were to take a, term like a, because the chemistry is a very erroneous exponent terms and uh, 
complex terms, if you just try to linearize it, you know how much how many terms it shows up, right? Everybody knows that. So uh, uh, people have attempted to do corrections, but it is not easy to do that. Therefore, there is no closed form approach for filtered reaction rate. The filtered reaction rate, by definition, does not exist because you can never find it. You know. Uh, so the opposite question, then people say, well. If you cannot filter the reaction rate, can I compute it exactly? That solves the problem, right? In theory, if I can solve the DNS people obviously compute it exactly. They don't care. You know, they can do finite rate. So the question is, can you, can we do it in LES exactly? The question is, well, if you're doing it exactly, you must your grid must be as fine as the DNS. But your grid is coarser than your DNS. So if you're doing computation of chemistry exactly without any closure. That's what we call laminar chemistry or un, you know, quasi laminar approach where basically you assume you're running chemistry with LES but the chemistry there's no closure. You just assume that the chemistry is computed, uh, is computed by the, just by the filtered quantities with no correlation of the fluctuation terms uh, and that has a problem in itself. So uh, like I said, this is some summarizing the, those models I mentioned. It all comes down to finding the flame surface densities and, and you have to deal with the turbulent time scales. Uh, the people in Surfax have done what they call a thickened flame approach, which is very useful for some applications. Their idea was that, well, we want to do finite rate chemistry. We want to do coarse grids. Uh, so how do we do that? So the only way they did was that they they artificially thicken the flame, so that instead of a flame being one grid point, they make it over five or six grid points by changing the diffusion coefficient, and they had changed the chemistry and the diffusion coefficient with this efficiency factor, so that even though the flame is thick, it is still propagating at the same speed. So the flame speed is still correct, and the adiabatic temperature is correct, but the structure of the flame is thick. Which basically means that if the flame wrinkling at the thick scale is gone, you you are dissipating, so it, it it is less wrinkled, it looks more diffused, but at least it burns correctly. You know that's the advantage of that, and I'll show you some examples in the next couple of weeks and uh, 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 classes. So. so you can combine all of these in methods. Uh, another popular flame uh, method is a G equation. I don't know if anybody is using that here. G equation is a geometry. Basically, you say here is a grid in line where it is reactants on one side, product on the other side, and instead of assuming laminar flame speed, we say the front is propagating at the turbulent flame speed. So, so that means that you now have to create a turbulent flame speed model. Typically, you need the laminar flame speed and the turbulent intensity, and there are many models for that. Uh, uh, it is very useful because for premixed systems that are in the flamelet type problems, doing this problem is trivial. It's just one equation. There is no chemistry. There is no stiffness. You know, it's a trivial. It cost is almost the same as non-reacting flow. There is a problem though. This equation, the G itself, is a level set. It has no physical meaning. It is a, you know, if you're familiar with that, so you have to reinitialize it to make it thin, things like that. But uh, it cannot do extinction properly because it's a, it has to have a continuous surface. But for many simple problems, it have, turns out to be a very easy way to do combustion. But there are people now who would argue that as you go to higher and higher turbulence, a model like this does not exist. I don't know whether Professor Williams and other people showed you turbulent flame speed models. But there is a, you know, when you go to higher and higher turbulence and you go into these broken regimes, the flame speed concept starts to become questionable. So G equations cannot work there. So you have to go back to finite rate chemistry. So, so the advantage of this is mitigated by to certain applications, but within the application, the cost of this is trivial approach. Sim, it's similar to mixture fraction, but it's a slightly different application. Another approach is the flame surface density that I was mentioning where you actually try to model that. and Everything now becomes uh, affected by that. There's a lots of models and variations of that out there, transport equations. Uh, again, this is mostly used for premix combustion. So that's why I was pointing out how do we go from premix to non-premix? 
I'm starting with premix approaches first and then and so this is the second approach that I mentioned which is uh, mixed diffraction progress variable. These are all classical textbook stuff. I mean if you're doing combustion you've seen that. It has again some limitations because in addition to the problems with closures, remember the filtering of this requires a closure also because there is a closure term coming from this, this part also. But there's a, another closure requirement here for the reaction rate, a progress variable rate which you have to use some assumed PDFs or uh, again there are variations of that. Uh, so I just gave this, these for completeness because uh, they are basically telling you different one approaches. More recently uh, uh, Swaminathan's group in, in uh, Cambridge were focusing on scalar dissipation closures and the idea behind that was that because this term is very difficult to close using these assumed PDFs, he, they wanted to relate this, this reaction rate to the, uh, uh, the, the, the scalar dissipation rate uh, which is defined like this term or the filtered scalar dissipation rate. Uh, um, um, and, but to do that they needed a model for the scalar dissipation rate. But once you can get that you can then tie this to that term. Uh, and there are lots of papers by them. I've got citations in here. Uh, what, what it basically does is that you can say that the filter reaction rate can be related to the scalar uh, dissipation rate which is an unknown which has to be modeled. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and for example like I was mentioning here the flamelet comes up, flamelets get that using presumed PDF methods. So in this particular approach it needs a, what happened here? You need a model for the scalar dissipation rate and the filtered uh, scalar gradient because uh, that's used in this, uh, in this model, in, in this model right here. You know. Something is missing here. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can derive the equation for that like that and then you can filter it. Uh, and the main thing that they showed was that in order to get that you have to have this term and you can read the papers that they have got. Uh, uh, and they did some a priori analysis of these results and showed that you can actually end up, excuse me, uh, a differential equation for scalar dissipation rate. And by the way, these are simple problems, so we don't know whether it's going to work in complex geometries I mean, in or complex uh, problems, but uh, mostly for premix again. But they showed that you can, using DNS analysis, that they can reduce it to an algebraic form uh, based on uh, in this form. So once they have that, they can they can use the closures. Uh, so if you want, there are papers cited in there. You can go look at it. And uh, uh, um, the, so that one, is, but the bottom line is that. Once you go to a progress variable mixed diffraction formulation, you still have a reaction rate type closure requirement. You, you can only the mixed diffraction approach, the pure mixed diffraction approach or the G equation approaches don't have any closure for uh, what I would call reaction rate. If even progress variable approaches have reaction rate closure requirements. And once you have finite rate, you have finite rate reaction closures. So once you go beyond that, you have to go to finite rate. So uh, So here is a summary, this is from Peter's book, kind of summary of different methods. I'm going to go through some of them. Uh, like I'll talk, you know, so typically if you're doing infinite fast chemistry, you can use these type of models. Notice how the models are named differently for premix for non-premix. There's no, nothing like partially premixed in here in some sense. But you can see from this that PDF methods, which solve for the PDFs, um, you know, it's finite rate with, doesn't have molecular mixing, but it, it can do the same PDF methods can work for premix and non premix. So obviously it has something independent of the type of problem. That's a good advantage. Uh, the finite rate methods uh, fit filter or model reaction rates are you can see there's a whole variation of this in uh, premix and non premix. By the way, the, it says flamelet, but the, uh, the exact form of flamelets are different. You know, you're, you know, I'm not, it's, it's similar concept, but there are details in it to do both of them together becomes tricky you know. And then the last one which I will cover tomorrow uh, is the linear eddy model that's the one we've been trying to develop just because of these challenges. How do we deal with 
small scale processes that must occur for combustion and finite rate. And, but at the same token, I don't want to close the finite rate because the finite rate cannot be too complicated to close it. You know, so, so how do we deal with that and large scale processes in the, in the same formulation uh, for both problems? So I guess I think I've already shown that before. Uh, so this is a summary of methods that are out there that are state of the art, I would think. Uh, I'm citing some references here because these are more recent. Uh, eddy breakup, eddy dissipation concepts, I'm assuming everybody knows. You know, it's a very simple concept. It is used, it's not very expensive. Typically works for one step mechanisms. Eddy breakup is typically premix, eddy dissipation is an expansion of that. <coughs> Partially stirred reactors is a variation of that. Thick and flame models can do chemistry. I'm actually going to talk briefly about the, I don't know how much time I have, but. Uh, I get home. How long is it? I'm supposed to. Tell us at 12:30. Is it 12:30 already? Okay, so I better stop now. Huh? Um, so I, uh, I've given you some descriptions of them. Again, these are summaries of good and the bad of these models, and each have their limitations. So I'm not going to. I don't want to go through all of them because it basically tells you what their each model does. I've already repeated that. Uh, what I wanted to point out is two things that flamelet models are steady flamelet models are very good to get the mean species but when you're leading with radicals uh, and species you get an extinction you have problems you have to deal with special treatment with when you're dealing with uh, uh, extinction problems uh, uh, pdf methods are good because they do chemistry correctly but don't have molecular mixing problems so it has problems with diffusion effects and it has numerical issues when you don't have large number of particles. And it has not also been used, that's trouble dealing with uh, 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 mixing because that is the, the fundamental and it becomes very expensive as you go to, uh, uh, to the problem. And the LEM LES approach, that one I want to talk about next class, is a, is a multi-grid approach, multi-scale approach where it attempts to capture the large scales on the large scales and the small scales on the small scales and, and try to couple them using a multi-grid, multi-scale approaches so that we try to recover the reactions and molecular diffusion at the small scales without any closure. And while we are trying to capture the large scales of the LES with the LES closure and try to couple them together. It has some limitations and advantages. I guess, uh, uh, I think i am got some you can read these, these are, this tells you some, what are the approaches, I don't want to get, there's a paper coming out on this, uh, 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 there's a paper in AIAA that reviewed all of this in details that we wrote. Uh, we are actually writing a book on LES of combustion with Christopher B, um, hopefully sometime next year. <laughs> uh, but we'll, where they, all these models will be discussed, but to the, Models are complicated or staged, but at the end you want to use it. As you notice in the chart of Leslie, I, I didn't have a lot of models in there because there's too much pain to write it. And then some of the models may not work in complex problems. You want to have models that will work in complex problems. So to me, uh, EDC perfectly stirred thick and flame models are the least expensive, very easy to implement, now, and it works for almost everything. You know, it's a very easy way to start combustion studies. CMC, conditional moment closures and turbulent PDF methods, they are used, they have some advantages, but no, I have yet to see it used in a complex geometry problem because it's too expensive, you know, and it's too complicated because of errors in that, but on canonical problems, it seems to work. Uh, this one, which is a, has some more fundamental physics, really doesn't seem to have applications yet. Uh, uh, all, most of the results I will show you is the two scale approach and which has some advantages uh, and, and, and the reason I'm saying that is I taught this course in AIAA a couple of years ago. I have some codes that I released them to release there. The codes are available. I can give it to you and I'll go through the code structure a little bit just to give you ideas. It's not my code. It is, it's, it's a standalone module. So if you want to build your own, linear ready model, you can go play with it, you know, so that, that's the advantage. So, uh, 
so that code, so I'll, in the next lecture I will go through some of that aspects as well. But I will spend the next, tomorrow's first, I got two lectures tomorrow, right? So the first, huh? not tomorrow, Monday two lectures, right? Yeah, so for first lecture on Monday I will be going through primarily on this linearity model, it is how it is implemented, what are the features and why, you know, not necessarily why it is the best one, but why we try to do that. And uh, then the second lecture I will spend mostly everything on gas phase combustion examples, applications to gas turbines and, and ramjets and, and then the uh, scramjets. And then the last lecture I will talk about spray combustion, which is the pictures that I showed in the beginning. Um, so with that I will stop and take some questions. Uh, in cost wise, it is very expensive. It is, uh, but the, uh, you will see it is, it is from a non-reacting to reacting, it is about three times more expensive. Compared to the reacting compared to smaller model, it is double? Yeah, it is about double, yeah. The, the LEM is very parallel, so it is, you have to use it in a parallel code and you will see that it scales very well in parallel computers. So the, it becomes more effective in there. But it, the, the finite rate chemistry is always the most expensive.